Man, I just, I, don't, I enjoy the singing. I, I just sometimes just want to sit and just absorb us, the worship. Heaven's got to be such a phenomenal place to be able just to worship God face to face. What a day that will be. It's really good to see you this morning. Uh, if you have your bulletin, I want to encourage you to get out your notes. And it's Valentine's. There's been kind of a love theme going on today. And so uh, I love to go to the book of Song of Solomon every so often. Uh, I got to admit, this is a book that I probably haven't preached a lot about especially early in my ministry. As a matter of fact, several years ago when I was up in St. Louis, we had what we called an un-Sunday. And so we had the people fill out some sheets about songs and choruses that, we, that go unsung. And we had them fill out, you know, who would be the most unlikely quartet. And they picked four guys that have never sang before. And so they picked them. And to give them credit, they got up and sang that day haven't sung since, but anyway, they, they got up and sang. It was pretty rough, but, but they sang. Can I tell you, I give them credit, and I think God smiled down. And so we had them pick out the most unlikely person to sing a, a solo. And so I kind of weaseled out of it a little bit. I did, I, on the piano, I can play Amazing Grace with one finger. So I kind of played Amazing Grace, and I, I talked through it. That was as close as I got to, to singing. But then uh, they, I said, what's the most unpreached book of the Bible? And the book most often written down was Song of Solomon. Now, Song of Solomon, how many of you like Hallmark movies? You'll love Song of Solomon. You know, I've, 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 actually, I've actually got to where I, I, can, I can watch Hallmark movies. Brenda and Courtney have got me watching Hallmark movies. And so I, I can usually leave for about an hour and a half and come in 10 minutes before it's up to, to see how they get together. Because they are going to get together in the end. There is a happy ending. Song of Solomon. Probably one of the greatest books in the Bible. And I, I, it's amazing. No matter what book I'm in, it always seems like the most important book of the Bible. But, you know, Jesus, again, when he was asked, what's the most important thing? He said it's a, to love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength and to love our neighbor. So Jesus said the most important thing is an intimate, passionate love relationship with God. And never will you see it more graphic than in the book of Song of Solomon. Song of Solomon has two basic meanings. There's a, a physical meaning, and I'm kind of sharing before we get there. But it's really about an incredible love relationship on earth that I think pictures our love relationship with God. So i got a picture of this love couch, and this is actually the couch that's in our prayer room right around the corner here. And so a love seat has enough room for two people. That's why they call it a, a love seat, all right? And so it's really an unlikely love story, Song of Solomon. It's between the king and a Shulamite uh, that really is kind of a impoverished. It could not be more of an opposite attraction there, but it's an incredible love story, an incredible love story. And so the very first verse says, the song of songs, which is Solomon's. Now we know according to 1 Kings, and I'll give you that verse in a minute, that Solomon wrote a thousand and five songs. He wrote a thousand songs. He had to be a romantic. Everybody say all. There's a few alls that need to go in here, all right? I'm just kind of prompting you, all right? So he wrote 1,005 songs. He had to be quite a romantic. But this is said to be the song of all songs. I mean, this is the song above every other song that he has written. And then I love how the complete Jewish Bible starts off, the ultimate song by Solomon. This is the ultimate song, and why? Because it's about the most important thing. So first of all, I just want to say to those of us who are married, your absolute most important relationship on earth is not between you and your children, but it's between you and your spouse. And I believe that we need to love our spouse unconditionally and, and just really express that love. And so this is a book about how married couples can have intimacy and express that intimacy and just really become passionately in love with each other. That's all right there, all right there, all right. So 
But it's also about an individual believer and how we need to be in love with God. I want to say, I love to be around a believer that's just passionately in love with God. Sometimes a new believer, I, I love to be around new believers that just, they're just so in love with God. And that's what the book of Song of Solomon, so it's about your most important relationship on earth, husband and wife. And let me say that if you invest all your love in your kids, and your kids are important, but if that's your expression of love, when your kids move out, you're in big trouble. And the greatest gift you can give your kids, all experts tell us, is that if a husband and wife love each other with that unconditional love, that's the greatest gift you can give your children. So it's about the most important relationship on earth between a husband and wife, but again, it's about the most important relationship, and that's between a believer and the Lord, all right? So Jewish tradition tells us, along with scholars, that, that they believe Solomon wrote the book. Uh, the Song of Solomon was written sometime near the early part of his, of his reign, so kind of tuck that away in your mind. The theme of the book is love, all right? I get, it is mushy, mushy, mushy love, all right? I was probably forbidden to read this when I was younger, all right? But it's really a very romantic, a very moving, moving book, all right? So Song of Solomon will cover the emotions and the passion of courtship, love, and intimacy within marriage and our relationship with God. So again, there's two meanings uh, uh, two applications to the book of Song of Solomon. There's a natural meaning, which would be a, a challenge for husbands and wives to have that incredible love relationship, and then a challenge to believers to have that kind of intimacy with God, all right? And so the natural application would teach us a healthy and passionate desire between a man and woman within the safety and holiness of the marriage covenant. I believe there should be an incredible love connection between a husband and wife. The spiritual meaning, I think, relates to our relationship with God. The Jews saw their nation married to God. I think I have some scriptures in your notes. And in the New Testament, the church is pictured as the bride of Christ. Now, one of the things the Song of Solomon will hopefully open your eyes, you should never pray as a beggar, but you should pray as a bride. Let me say that again. You should never pray as a beggar. But when you understand that we're the bride of Christ, it will change how you approach God and really change uh, how you see God's love for you as well. So there's two primary characters in the book of Song of Solomon. There's King Solomon, who is called the Beloved. Yeah, three of you got it. Three of you got it. And so you, you wives may want to use this tonight before you go to bed to look at him and bat your eyes and call him the beloved, all right? Then there's the Shulamite woman. She's engaged and later married to the king. And so again, it's really an incredible, passionate love relationship. The daughters of Jerusalem come in, virgins who encourage the Shulamite woman and desire themselves to draw near to the king. And I believe we all should be encouraging each other to draw near to the king. That should be part of the, the journey that we're on, all right? And so again, the Shulamite, uh, Solomon, and she gets kind of hit with the love arrow there. How many of you remember when you got hit with the love arrow? All of a sudden, you couldn't stop thinking about them. And you had 45 pictures you wanted to show everybody about them. The love arrow, when it strikes... Again, a very unlikely love story. It really it could not be two more opposite people. And yet, again, when I read this and I realize, you think, man, why, why would he go after someone so opposite? And then you realize that God loved me, who could not be more opposite than God. And when you begin to see yourself and the love that God has for you, it really is one of the most humbling books of the Bible to realize how passionately God loves you as you are, all right? So a few facts about Song of Solomon. We've already said in 1 Kings 4.32, it tells us that Solomon wrote 1,005 songs, but this is said to be the song of songs. 
So it really has a special meaning. And again, the reason I think it's so special is because it deals with the most important thing. And that's a love relationship between a husband and wife and a love relationship between us and God. That's why I think it's such an incredible song. The Jews would read this song during Passover and they refer to it as the Holy of Holies. Isn't that interesting? They refer to Song of Solomon as the Holy of Holies. The Holy of Holies is where only the high priest could go once a year in the presence of God. They're saying that this book, when you get into this book and understand this book, you are literally getting into the Holy of Holies, into the intimacy with God. That's why the book is so much of a challenge and so exciting to look through. Number three, just to note, God is not mentioned by name in this book. Number four, Song of Solomon is never quoted in the New Testament. Number five, the word translated song frequently refers to music that brings honor and glory to God. And so it can refer to music as well. Number five, this is the longest song in the Bible. And number seven, the woman speaks first and most often in the book. And I'm not going to comment about that, all right? So the, wa the woman speaks first and most often. And if I'm being honest, she's really the romantic all right? She is a, a real romantic. And for the most part, I'm not saying it's always true, but for the most part, most part, women are much more able to express love. Sometimes us guys need to go through a course or something. We're like the old country boy said, I told you I loved you when we got married. If it changes, I'll let you know. <laughs> no, that's not the way to do it. So Song of Solomon is about not only being in love, but expressing that love. And it, it really gets mushy. It gets mushy. It's probably not a Sunday morning sermon, all right? Probably not. Probably adult Bible school. You know, probably adult Bible school or Sunday school class with adults. That's maybe the best place to go through it. So again, it gets kind of deep and mushy. All right, so in the book of Song of Solomon, there's a lot of expressions of love. Yeah. Yeah. Stay with me. Stay with me. Now, back then, expressions are different. How many of you know times have changed? All right, times have changed. But we're going to read this, and we're going to read some that Solomon said to the Shulamite, and then what the Shulamite said to Solomon, all right? So here's what I want us to do. I want all the men to read Solomon, his part. All the women read the Shulamite. And if your spouse is here, if your spouse is here, sit next to hold hands. And I want you to look in their eye, and as romantically as you can on a Sunday morning, I want you to repeat these, these words, all right? Some of y'all look a little excited, all right? You've been wanting to hold her hand, just haven't slept, you know, scooted over there. All right, so these are some expressions. Guys are going to read Solomon. Gals are going to read the Shulamite. And so here's some of the compliments. All right, guys. Your hair is like a flock of goats. Now you want to say that in love. That may be one you want to pray about. All right, pray about. Ladies, your doves washed. These are good, aren't they? Some of y'all, some of y'all are writing them down. Some of you gonna use them tonight. All right. Okay, guys. Your teeth are like a flock of shorn sheep. Oh, that's probably better than your teeth are like stars. They come out at night, all right? So anyway, but you always, you always want some. All right, ladies, Shulamite. Are like lilies. I think you guys ought to write that one down. That's good. That's good. And I'm just being, I mean, the Shulamite seems much more connected with with romance, but again, the king, you know, he, I think he, everything is good, but it just, you have to kind of interpret it. All right, la guys, your garments smell like Lebanon. I don't know what that means. Lebanon was known for their lumber. Maybe they smell like a cord of wood. I don't know. Man, you smell like a cord of wood, honey. All right, ladies, like a gazelle leaping on the mountains. That'll move those guys. Yeah. You guys are like leaping from mountain to mountain. You guys are awesome. All right, guys, your waist is like a heap of wheat. 
That one I'd pray about, all right? Put that down on the, I'm not so sure about, all right? Ladies, eggs are like pillars of marble. Yeah. I can tell there's going to be some romance tonight. I feel it. I sense it. I sense that this, this service will change your, your marriage forever. Some of you guys will be on the couch tonight. I feel it. Anyway, guys, your navel is like a round goblet. Wow. Say it in love. Say it in love. Ladies, your cheeks are like a bed of spices. That's good stuff. All right. Guys, your temples are like a piece of pomegranate. I have no idea. You just say it. <laughs> Smile. Ladies, your hands are like rods of gold. Yeah. Yeah, that's good stuff. <laughs> Guys, your nose is like the Tower of Lebanon, which looks toward Damascus. <laughs> I'm not sure I would use that, guys. I'm just saying. Just pray. Pray about that one, all right? Ladies. So a lot of crazy things, a lot of crazy statements, but believe it or not, it is mushy back in that day. Now, again, there's something about expressing that love that's really important. And again, guys, for the most part, struggle more than the ladies do. But again, to be passionately in love with our spouse is so important. And and the Song of Solomon is an incredible book that challenges us to be passionately in love as couples. But again, also challenges us as believers to be passionately in love with God. And that I struggle with that as well, all right? So someone sent me this. A couple people sent me this. But how many of you remember those Valentines, those little... uh, if it was back in uh, Solomon's time, they may have said something like this. Hey, tower neck, high dove eyes, your teeth are like sheep, you got goat hair. All right? Probably look different than they do today. All right? But again, meant to be romantic. Meant to be romantic. All right? Very good. So the Shulamite, she realizes that she has flaws. And in the very first chapter, I think it's like verses 5 and 6, She talks about the flaws in her life. She's kind of blown away that the king would love her. And she says some statements, I am dark but lovely. Now, I don't know what all these mean, if I'm being honest. Some say, well, she was out in the sun a lot. Her skin was kind of roughed up because she just was out there just working and surviving. And and again, she was living a totally different life than the king. She says her skin... Uh, it was dark and lovely like the tints of Keter, and they say those were made out of goat hair, all right, goat hair. Now, if you've ever rubbed goat hair, it probably wouldn't be good to say to your wife, your skin is like goat hair. No, that's probably not a good one. But she's saying it about herself. She says, I have a rugged life. I'm so opposite of the king. And she says, my own vineyard I have not kept. I've been so busy helping other people, I haven't even kept my own vineyard. And so the love story really is incredible that the king would love the Shulamite. And when you realize that we're the Shulamite, that we should be amazed. And one day when we get to heaven and we see God face to face, when we see the holiness of God and the Shekinah glory of God, and to realize that he would love us with all of our flaws, I think we are going to be blown away. And so in many ways, we're like the Shulamite. And I I, want to say today that one of the greatest gifts you can get in the Christian life is to receive God's unconditional love exactly where you are in the process. Most of my life, I'm just being honest, most of my life as I look back, I've spent most of my life believing that if I could just get this straightened out, if I can just get to here, if I can just do more of this, somehow God would love me. I want to tell you that's a lie. To receive that God loves you, warts and all, flaws and all, is such an incredible gift. And I want to say from the heart of God that right where you are in the process, God loves you unconditionally. And he knows you've got some things to work on and he's willing to help you work on it. 
But he absolutely is passionately in love with you right now. I love how the Bible says in Romans 8, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who walk after the Spirit. I want to tell you, the voice of God, I do not believe, will condemn, continually condemn us. I think God wants to love on us and tell us who we are in Christ. I remember when I was in high school, we had an open gym night at our church. and It was up at the high school, Berkeley High School. And I remember one of my friends was off in the corner, and he was just sitting there crying. He was one of the most popular guys in our school. He lived two, three doors down from me. He was on the diving team. He dove at Six Flags back in the day. They had that guy stand up there and dive into the little tank. He was one of those guys. But every, everybody loved him, super popular. He was over in the corner just, I mean, just bawling. And so I saw him, I went over there, and I tried to talk to him, and he, he couldn't talk. He just sat there. I didn't know if someone had done something to him. I, I really wasn't sure. But finally, after about 20 minutes or so, I said, what's going on? He says, I, I, don't, I don't know. I was just over here, and all of a sudden, he said, God just came down. And all of a sudden, God just loved on me, and God just showed me. I mean, he said, I just, God just showed up, and he just sat there crying. Somehow, on a gym night, up at the high school, God showed up and reminded Doug how much he loved him. You know, when you really do discover the love of God, and that nothing can separate you from that love, some of you are going to experience that love this week as you're driving down the road, and God's love will come on you, and you'll have to pull off the road. I think we'll really be amazed, and that's why I love the book of Song of Solomon, because I see myself as the Shulamite and how unworthy I am of the love of God. And yet he passionately loves us exactly as we are. I want to compare the Christian life to an assembly line just for a minute. And some of you, how many of you have worked on an assembly line? All right, quite a few of you here. Now, I, I actually got a job at Ford Motor Company. I don't know if I've ever shared this. I went and filled out the paperwork. I knew somebody at Ford. They got me an interview. I went, filled out all the paperwork, took the physical. I was supposed to start within a week or so, and they never called me. And probably God had his hand on that because if I would have went to work for Ford, other things would have maybe been different. But, you know, you think about a car going through the assembly line, you know, each step of the process has its purpose. You know, a car that's just starting out on number one can't be upset that they're not number five. As that car goes through the assembly line, every step has a purpose. And every step of the assembly line, that car is exactly where it needs to be at that moment. But there comes a point when it finally gets to the end, number five there, that the car drives off the assembly line and goes out for sale. I want you to think about the Christian life, and I just want to remind you that we are on the assembly line. As long as I have breath, as long as I'm standing up, I'm in the process of becoming more like Jesus. All right, so I want to just kind of drop this in. From the time we get saved... God has in mind to make us more like Jesus. And so we begin the process, if you will, that assembly line of making us more like Jesus. And I just want to say, no matter how long you live, you're not going to be there. As long as you're alive, you're still on the assembly line, still becoming more like Jesus. But there comes a day... As number five, that we cross over to the other side, the Bible says we all have an appointed time to die. It's at that moment that we drive off the assembly line of life and we eject out of our earth suit and go be with the Lord. On that day, we become complete. But until that day, I just want to remind you as you look around, we're all a work in progress, every one of us. But if we wait till we get it all together for God to love us, we're never going to be in love with God on this side. And when you discover that God loves you, flaws and all, he knows that you're a work in progress. If you can receive the love of God right where you are today, it's one of the most incredible gifts you can give yourself. To truly know that God loves you passionately 
as you are today is such an incredible gift. I have a sign up my office that says, Pastor Under Construction. And I know maybe you'll hear some things about the pastor here at the Ridge. And I just want to tell you, there are no perfect pastors. There are no perfect people. But I believe when we understand that everybody we're looking at is on the assembly line to become more like Jesus. That's why I believe the grace of God is so amazing and the love of God is so amazing. That he loves us on every step of the process. I love this verse in Philippians 1, 6. Let's read it together. He who has begun a good work in you will complete it. I guarantee you that God is faithful to see us through the process. But along the process, he loves us unconditionally. Now, this may seem a little bit weird, but one day, one day you may hear that Roger Johnson has died. First of all, again, don't believe it! Now, when we say death, we're only talking about the earth suit giving out. But it's on that day, the day that I step out of my earth suit. And by the way, you always want the elevator to go up. <laughs> on that day, when you hear Roger Johnson has died, I want you to turn to somebody and say, he made it. It's then that I can honestly say, construction complete. Thank you for your patience. You know, I want to say the grace of God. I think it was just really just in the last six months, God is trying to teach me to receive the love of God. And again, I'm so performance driven. It's so hard to believe that God can love us through the process. That's why Song of Solomon is so important. Because we're all striving to somehow perform to God, to get up to a point, to know that he loves us. He's absolutely passionately in love with us as we are. It's such an incredible gift. I told Brenda, I said, you know, when I, when I die, I don't want any flowers. I get nothing wrong with flowers. I love flowers. But I said, I'd love a bouquet of balloons on my casket. Just throw a bunch of my illustrations in the casket with me. She said, you better write it down or they'll all think I'm crazy. <laughs> so you all vouch for her. I don't know how many people have made it, people have come up to me and said, Pastor, will you do my, my, would you do my message when I, when I pass away? I said, well, here's the deal. I'll do the message if you go first. But if I go first, you have to dance at my funeral. <laughs> there better be a lot of dancing. And again, I know there's a time to mourn, but if we're being honest, every time I get a chance, and, and, and I, I look at Dan and Sherry there, who have lost three parents in the last six weeks. My heart goes out to you guys. But I have to say, every time I'm standing over somebody, there's an excitement when they're a believer because I know the construction's complete. But man, they're in the presence of God. They made it to the other side. That's a celebration. Then she gets kind of mushy here. She gets struck with that love arrow. Let's read together verses 2 through 4. Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth. Draw me away. The king has brought me in. She wants the kisses of his mouth. That's moving right there. You know, in the Bible, I just put down, I don't even know if this is on your notes, but you know, in the Bible, there's the kiss on the neck of forgiveness. There's the kiss on the feet of worship. There's the kiss on the cheek of betrayal. The kiss of fellowship. And I don't even know what that is, to be honest, when the Bible says, greet one another with a holy kiss. But can I tell you the kiss between a husband and a wife and a passionate kiss is the greatest expression of love. Just being able to not only tell each other, but to be able to just physically love each other, I believe is important in a marriage. And so she is just passionately desiring that intimate relationship 
uh, with the king, which again, we should have with God. She says your love is better than wine. Some people believe that wine is kind of a product of the world that gives us a temporary high, produces happiness and, and fleshly feelings of passion. It's interesting, on the day of Pentecost, these believers who were filled with the Spirit were accused of being drunk with wine. Isn't that funny? Wouldn't you love to see someday us just to be so swallowed up in the love of God that when we left the church, we would look like we were all drunk? Wouldn't that be cool? Maybe you don't think so. I, I think it'd be awesome. You know, when you get overwhelmed by the love of God, it literally will consume you to know how much God really loves you. He says, the king has brought me into his chambers. I love the psalmist, as he said, as the deer pants for the water brook, so pants my soul for you, O God, my soul thirsts for you. And I want to close with this uh, screen here. At the very end, she actually, it's a beautiful prayer of just desiring the love of the king. And so I want us to, if we can, let's stand together. This is a good passage to read at a wedding. But as the Shulamite is talking to the king, she's just, she's just wanting to be swallowed up in his love. And I want you this morning just to take a minute, and I want you to be like a sponge. I just want you to receive that unconditional love of God. Let's read this. It's a beautiful prayer, really. Would you join me? Place me like a seal over your heart like a seal on your arm for love is as strong as death its jealousy as enduring as the grave love flashes like fire the brightest kind of flame many waters cannot quench love nor can rivers drown it if a man tried to buy love with all of his wealth his offer would be utterly scorned i want us to take just a minute today if your spouse is here, I just want you to hold their hand for just a minute. I want to publicly say that in this book, on both sides, I believe that as a husband, the one person I probably have not been as faithful really lavishing that love on is my wife. My wife's always been important. We've been blessed to be able to work together. We've been able to do a lot of stuff together. But I feel like God, through this book, has told me that I need to be more faithful expressing. I'm so thankful to have a wife that has just been so supportive of ministry. And so for me personally, it's a challenge to be the husband that I need to be to her. But then as a believer, that I need to really be, have that passionate love for God. So I want us to take just a minute. As David comes, he's going to play softly. I just want to take a minute, and I just want it. I know it's hard to be silent in church. But I just want to take a minute or so, and I just want us to be quiet. I just want you to let God just love on you for just a minute. Maybe you're here today, and you need someone to pray with you or pray for you. We would love to do that. Maybe you're visiting, and this is where God is leading you to plug in and become a member. We invite you to come. But I'm asking every believer just to receive the unconditional love of God. That you're on that assembly line to become more like Jesus. And God has you exactly where you need to be. There's no better day than today to receive that love. Would you just receive that unconditional love? not feeling good she's on the very back there if I could get a few ladies to slip out and just go back and pray for Wilma I know that would mean a lot so if I could get a few ladies whoever feels led she's in the very back there
also just want to mention to you this Thursday they're going to have a prayer time here from 11 to 1 if anyone can come but we also always want to be praying for what's really going on in your life so I want to encourage you to take a minute before you leave today there's maybe some cards in your pew if not the part of the bulletin you tear off I just want you to think about the miracle that you need from God what is going on in your life because we want to pray for you this week we want to pray for what's really going on you don't have to sign the card I find that sometimes it's easier to be open and honest and transparent if you don't sign but if you can there's a red box in the back there just fill it out drop it in that box and I want to promise you this week we are going to pray for you guys let's pray together we're going to close with a song today if you feel comfortable to maybe raise a hand or two hands, I just want us to reach up to heaven. And I have to believe that every time a child reaches up, a parent will reach down, just a natural reaction. Father, as your children, we just want to receive your love. It's so easy to quote that nothing can separate us from your love. Sometimes we have a hard time receiving it. I pray that everyone here would be passionately in love with you. That God, they would experience that unconditional love through the process of life. I thank you for the married couples who are here, and I pray that revival would begin in the home, that we would truly be passionately in love with each other that we would begin to express that love. Fill us with your spirit. May that river of living water spill out everywhere we go this week. In Jesus' name.